Hello everybody and welcome to episode 9 of our My Hero Academia review podcast. If you didn't know, each and every week the two of us read through two volumes of the My Hero Academia manga, then sit down on this channel and review it. I am your host Hoodie, that is my co-host Zero, and this is Training Arc. If you're watching this as it goes up live on YouTube, then consider heading on over to patreon.com slash k2it and pledging a couple bucks to get the next episode early. But before we get into My Hero Academia, let's do some housekeeping. All right, so we have one more episode of Training Arc in its current form. You know, I am going to be evolving. You know, I'm transcending <laughs> my current Padawan status and perhaps FDU. moving on to... What was that? After you finish reading your first manga or catch up to it, that's when you hit level two. Yeah, I'm about to go to level two. <laughs> uh, so basically, yes, as you just alluded to, we are about to catch up to where My Hero Academia is. This is There are four volumes left. Two of them are going to be covered in this episode. Next episode, so one week from now, is going to cover the next and last two volumes as it currently stands. Now, there are technically some more chapters that have just yet to be chronicled into a volume the way this is going to be the way that that's going to work is um so this week we're going to do two volumes and then next week we're going to do two volumes plus however many chapters it takes to finish out that arc and then so if, let's say you know there are like 12 chapters left that aren't chronicled into a volume and five of those are starting their new arc then those five chapters won't be read and we will get to those because Despite us moving on, we will be moving on to a new manga once we catch up. Despite that, we will revisit My Hero Academia basically at the end of every new arc, which is kind of subject to, you know, just sort of personal... Basically, Zero Zero is going to keep up with the manga week to week, and he's just going to let me know, like, hey, this is a good point to jump back in. So every basically every once in a while... Maybe like, I don't know, every month and a half, however long it takes. We're going to jump back to do one more episode of My Hero, uh, My Hero Academia. But after next week, we will be moving on to a new manga, which I will not announce in this episode. That will probably be, probably be revealed in maybe like a day or so after next week's episode. I'll probably upload its own video to tease that. Maybe on the main channel. Who knows? That's all I think I have for housekeeping on that matter. Did I miss anything? Mm, no, that's all their uh, training arc stuff. Of course, this is still the My Hero Academia season of training arc. In every episode, we like to throw a question out there for you all to discuss. Last week, we asked you, who has been your favorite minor villain? If you want to hear our answers, head on over to the previous episode. This week, question of the week is, which character has had the most impressive character arc? Now, not necessarily who is your favorite, because I think there are, there's a pretty big difference like for example not that this is my answer for either question but uh i think you could i think some people could say mirio was their favorite character I, however i would not personally classify him as like impressive in terms of a character arc so right you know like you know i like aizawa he hasn't really developed all that much or i guess it depends on how you look at it there, there's room for interpretation here but that's basically the gist of the question which character has had the most impressive character arc we'll give you our answers at the end of the video let us know yours in the comment section below all right zero hit us with a summary of the overhaul fight so uh <clears throat> one thing we actually forgot to mention last episode was that there were league of villains members working with the yakuza um first Tuga. thing yeah, we got Toga and Twice. Mm -hmm. They were the, uh, I guess, uh, coordination. And they basically betray the Yakuza. They end up helping the building bender boy get caught and end up helping uh, the Ryukyu team find Overhaul when he's fighting Deku. But that's uh, skipping ahead a little bit. Yeah, they actually don't... I don't actually even know why Overhaul needed them. <laughs> it sort of seems <laughs> like they were only here just to fuck him over, and they didn't Basically. really serve. They didn't really serve a purpose to Overhaul's plan. So you kind of you kind of just screwed up on that one, buddy. 
<laughs> yeah, he was just like, all right, I'll just take two of you guys. And <laughs> Shigaraki's like, you sure? And he's like, yeah, why not? I don't see the problem. We're friends, right? And you know, in hindsight, <laughs> he kind of fronted the whole thing as this like super strategic master plan. I mean, that's his whole basic thing, right? He, he comes in, he says, I got a plan. You guys don't have a plan. He Then he busts out the shogi board and says, you know, tries to prove his high IQ. And then in the end, he just gets bested by... The two dumbest people of the League of Villains? No, great. <laughs> it's Shigaraki's plan, of course, but, like, it's carried out by two of the idiots. So, yeah. uh, bit of an oversight on that one, overhaul. But, anyways, go ahead. So, uh, Mirio catches up to overhaul like an idiot. He does a bunch of badass stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but, ultimately, he ends up getting taken down by a quirk-removing bullet. Which he ended up taking because it was pointed at Eri. So, you know, big hero boy. Yeah, actually, quick interjection, though. Um, I'm actually wondering how you feel about this. I, I didn't have this written down in my notes, but it just kind of popped it in, into my head. Do you feel like this was... So what something that happened a lot in these this these two volumes was basically just jumping around in time because you know we had a yeah. series of events going on and you know like so for example for the Mirio like uh, chasing him down it they there was literally just a a box that said meanwhile like uh, two minutes after Mirio left and presumably a lot more time has passed for other people um, do you feel like that was kind of lazy. I didn't necessarily think of this. I didn't think of this at the time. You know, it didn't strike me as like, wow, this is what a lazy writing, you know, device. But now that I'm thinking about it, like, is, was there no better way to do this than to literally just say, ah, oh, shit, I forgot to write the Mirio section. All right, go back two minutes. And we're going to go back to there. No, that's obviously prescribing a little bit of um, um, idiocy to Horikoshi that I'm sure, I'm sure it was planned. But it just seems, I don't know, not as um, grandiose as one might expect. I did kind of have that thought when it, when we do end up being shown the Ryukyu team, because it's like, uh, it flashes back to when they were like, all right, we'll take it from here, and everyone else went inside. And then it's like, 20 minutes later, so it's like, what the fuck happened in that 20 <laughs> minutes? <laughs> it just seems like... I don't know, maybe maybe I'm wrong here, but it like the, 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 thing, the idea that pops to my head is like, you know... It feels like instead of going, let's tell a complete story here, then flash backward, tell a complete story there, and then flash backward, tell a complete story there. Like, it feels like these should have been intermingled, like, without, you know, you get what I'm saying? Like, they should have just been happening. Like, we should have just gotten, like, maybe three pages of one fight, cut back to three pages of a different fight, cut two, three. Now, maybe, you know, as I'm saying that, it does sound like a little complicated. Um, It's possible that it could have been executed better. That's how I imagine it. But it just seems like... You know, you gave the example of the, uh, you know, the the big fight when they first enter the thing where it's like this gigantic uh, creature comes out. You know, that one to me obviously stuck out as like the biggest of sort of, um, you know, just like sort of like revisionist type thing. Where if, if I were to guess that Horikoshi did actually just forget to do anything like and had to rewind to fix it, that would be the one where it was like, oh, we're going all the way back. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> So yeah, that was definitely the most noticeable example. So what do you what do you think? Do you think maybe I don't know? Do you think it? Do you think I'm overreacting? Is this is this bad? Or can we just forget about this? Or what do you think? I did kind of dismiss the fear because uh, clearly Horikoshi. I feel like he probably wants to show us these scenes and events in a particular order. Probably, I mean, he saved all the Mirio stuff for last, so that leads me to believe like he's organizing it based on the level of impact it may have or something like that perhaps i I mean that that sounds reasonable let us know your thoughts in the comment section on that one go ahead that the go ahead was to you oh (laughs) so uh yeah after getting his quirk removed after like running ahead by himself mirio continues to fight like three gangsters by himself with no quirk, like Which, fucking Batman over here. But conveniently, we don't see this part. <laughs> conveniently, <laughs> he just yeah. we we He's cut like, to like him okay, punching over all. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> well, sure. I guess I'll just accept that Mirio somehow beat them all up without his quirk. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Deku shows up, and then he's like, "Gosh, how do I even get close to this guy? He's sp- sending spikes everywhere." 
That's clearly not a problem for Miria. He could just walk right through him, even without his quirk. But uh, Deku and Over and Eraserhead do show up. Eraserhead gets snatched by some uh, Yakuza boy. Uh, Overhaul kills and fuses with one of his underlings and ends up, I don't know, getting a power up from it. This was th- this was super confusing for me. I don't know if this was like <laughs> a miscommunication in art or something, but I don't even know what he really gained from doing that. Like <laughs> he, he his just... arms definitely look weird now. Yeah, he fused. He just is this just is this the equivalent of just having like double strength basically because you are literally just double people <laughs> like you you are two people now is that all that happened because it's not like his he got he's not like he absorbed this guy's quirk or anything he just yeah it definitely didn't seem like he did that so i don't i don't know what this power up was but i guess i just accepted it sure <laughs> whatever well at the very least it seemed like he did it to like reset his uh health bar because you know it, he was getting his ass whooped by mirio and deku said something like he's disassembling and reassembling himself to reduce the damage he's taken or something like that but i don't know it didn't seem like it was really giving him that much of a benefit aside from his arms changing shape yeah <laughs> that's about maybe it. we missed something uh, maybe when we, this one gets animated it'll be a little more clear because i i do think some of it has to be like prescribed to the fact that you know the art is not necessarily that the art was bad but you know there's just there's so much like black going on i can't you know i, I can't tell <laughs> yeah you need more colors in manga <laughs> yes please thank you <laughs> go ahead <clears throat> so deku he has to fight this new overhaul by himself basically and also while protecting eri and well he actually tells mirio to bring eri like to safety but mirio's he's pretty broken up by this point <laughs> yeah and so, importantly he, wait well has um has night eye arrived yet or night eye is there yeah I'm not sure when he arrived and well we get we get a pretty huge bomb with night eye which is to say that uh night eye has seen the future and thinks well according to him knows that both he and deku die in this fi- uh in this battle yeah, if I had to guess, he probably used prediction on Shisaki to like fight him or something, and he's just at like, some point. I don't remember when, but <laughs> <laughs> but he sees this vision of everyone dying and Shisaki getting away, and Deku, he's like, "Yeah, well, fuck that." <laughs> I, I'll I'll say this uh this one um you know in in the grand scheme of like shows that tackle free will you know like steins gate or something this one was handled with a little less tact it really did just feel <laughs> like uh you know night i was saying this is this is the predetermined future and deku was literally just saying nah it's cool <laughs> i'm just not do that which is like okay sure i guess i don't it just it feels like i don't know like a a, a really good story could have handled that a lot more interestingly yeah i guess in Night Eye's case, it's like, he, because of the way his power works, either he has had his visions be proven false, and he knows that they can work that way, or he's never had a vision proven false, which either means they're true 100% of the time, or they've just never been disproven. Well, they do talk about this later on, just to, well, you know, spoiler alert but i mean obviously you guys probably should have read this um they do talk about this when night eye is like dying he talks about how you know um oh shoot what was i gonna say he talks about something something about his wow i just completely lost my train of thought is about a bending fate yes but i don't know what i was specifically gonna say (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all right uh i guess just forget that point and we'll get i'll probably remember it when we talk about like night eye dying so go ahead keep yeah going. so uh <clears throat> while deku you know he's fighting overhaul mirio he's trying to bring a uh, little eri to safety but he's like keeled over from his injuries and just emotional stress <laughs> so he basically is like listen eri you just gotta keep walking. I'll just <laughs> yeah. lie on the floor here. <laughs> I just gotta take a quick nap. 
And she's like, okay. And then she walks back to Ophel. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, this Eri character, I think, is has turned out to be... It actually kind of reminds me of... Um, not anything specific, but it reminds me of like a type of character that would get introduced in like a movie. If, like, so for example, if like this was Pokemon, um, in like the po- in the third Pokemon movie with Entei, uh, Entei, there's just like a little girl character who's introduced and only exists in that movie. Um, this kind of feels like a similar situation where it's just like this character really just came out of nowhere and like is really integral to the plot, but it does accomplish that like movie type thing where it's like, yeah, I actually do care about this character. You know, it it this is something that My Hero Academia does fairly well and we can talk about this more when i answer the question of the week uh, of introducing characters but it, something about Ari specifically where it just it does feel like she is i mean this is the the magic of character design of making your character like a, a small child obviously i'm more inclined to care about them so i i think right. must protect yeah i i do think uh i ended up coming i don't know if i mean surely this character has to come well i said the same thing about coda and he hasn't come back yet so uh <laughs> Who knows? But I would imagine this character comes back, and you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm down. I'm interested. Yeah. Every, I, I mean, uh, there are characters like this in Naruto movies as well. Like, just she does kind of feel like a filler character, but they manage to make her important to the main plot. So you know, actually, the more I think about she... this, this almost kind of feels this this whole arc almost kind of just feels like a movie. <laughs> It, like in the <laughs> like this feels like the plot to I feel like I'm actually thinking this is a plot to an Arsa movie. It's it's the, hmm. the one I'm thinking of, and maybe I'm completely wrong here. But the Naruto movie I'm thinking of is it's uh, Naruto, Sakura, and Rock Lee. Like they're <laughs> they're on a boat, and yeah, you know. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. There there is a little boy character in that one, and actually, there's even the scene. Well, this is a little different, but like just for visual imagery, there's a scene at the end of that movie where Naruto is like he can't walk anymore, so he's like on the back of another guy, and that guy is carrying him to Rasengan. The bad guy, now, like these are different situations, <laughs> but you you get the visual imagery being paralleled here, right? Where it's like Eri sure. is on Deku's back. I'm just saying, I've, I've noticed some coincidences here. <laughs> Well, Horikoshi's clearly a big fan. He was like, uh, I don't know what this next arc's gonna be about. I'll just watch some Naruto <laughs> movies. Because <laughs> he knows no one else has. So <laughs> no one's gonna call him out except me. <laughs> yeah. He's really gonna be brought to task here in our podcast. <laughs> Alright, go ahead. So, uh, Eri basically like walks back to Overhaul, but she just wants to be saved so bad that she reaches out for Mirio's cape and at the same time her quirk activates so she separates Chisaki and this other gangster I don't even remember which one it was and basically you know resets them both to normal oh okay so that's what her quirk did because I swear to god I had no idea what this what happened here (laughs) I was like (laughs) how did her quirk save her like I don't I thought she like I don't know. I I honestly had no idea. So what? So clarify. She used her quirk accidentally, separated the two, um, Chisaki and the, the other gangster, and by doing that, they like accidentally released her. Is that what happened? Um. Well, if I had to guess, it was because uh, Overhaul either wasn't touching her or was holding her with like the fused arm that she would have undone when she defused them. Right. So, but the point is that by using her power, she was let go. Because in my head, just trying to like figure out what was happening on the page, I figured she used her quirk on Mirio's cape and that led to something, but I just couldn't figure out what it led to. And I don't know. When we talk about, when we get into general thoughts, I, I'm going to talk about this a little more, but this, this has been a, a kind of confusing volume for me. To be honest, this whole fight has been a little hard to like decipher what exactly is going on. Yeah, I'd say more than most of the fights up to this point, this has been like a, a visually confusing uh, like climax. But, <clears throat> you know, that's how it goes sometimes. Yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> so, you know, as she uh, frees herself from overhaul, 
Deku catches her basically and uh Hmm. Uh, basically, when does he start using well, the okay. 100%? So I think what happens, and I might be wrong here, but I think he catches her and like um, Chisaki like, goes to attack him and he instinctively he goes... Her. Or he kicks her. He does not kick her. That's, <laughs> he he does her. not 100% <laughs> all, you know, all for, or one for all kick her into oblivion. I he, will protect you, little girl. <laughs> it's the only way. No, he kicks the air and that blasts him, and then they basically just go into like a DBZ, you know, aerial <laughs> blowing everything up fight, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically that's uh, basically yeah. the gist is that because you know he was able to go one hundred percent, and um, because you know her quirk is like reversing time, she in- instinctively or accidentally reversed all of his injuries before he could even feel them. Now, interesting thing right. of note here, um is that this is from from my understanding just like looking at the images and seeing some discussion online it seems to be the case that not only did she reverse the the injuries of that specific situation she also reversed injuries of earlier situations uh notably like the muscular fight uh those scars are no longer there and i think some of the stain stuff is no longer or not not stain um some of the uh todoroki scars are not there so uh she did a overheal him a little yeah which now in 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 universe hey that's cool but uh thematically speaking this is starting to rub me the wrong way you know um to go back to points i made about the muscular fight we're kind of doing that thing again where it's just like well deku you just gotta you know hit harder and you know (laughs) it's gonna work out and it worked out like it it 100 percent worked out it worked out better than it ever did you know he <laughs> we got to see deku at full power with no consequences whatsoever in fact it only benefited him now obviously there's still some room you know there's more story to be told here maybe for some reason it does hurt him in the long run i don't know but as to where we stand right now it really feels like i was kind of you know I, you know, I, there were some arguments that, you know, someone like Math was made about the muscular fight in specific that made me rethink my arguments about that and, like, made me think, okay, maybe I was a bit off on, like, the thematic, you know, message of that fight in particular. But, you know, when it becomes one piece of the puzzle that is, you know, this whole show and this is another piece, I'm starting to think that, you know, we may be getting into some rough territory of uh, Deku basically just going into, despite all of his intelligence, despite all of his, you know, innovation and adaptation to how he uses his quirk, like developing shoot style, it ultimately all just comes back down to, I gotta hit hard. I wouldn't say that in this case, because, you know, Deku's talent for analyzing quirks is what made him realize he could go to this length and, like, abuse Eri's power. And in fact, that he basically had to, otherwise he would have, like, passed out while he was holding her, and Chisaki would have just snatched her again. Yeah, but I don't think, I mean, we're talking about, like, constructs of the narrative, right? Like, there was nothing, like, there's nothing inherent about that fight that needed to reach that level, you know? Like, I don't, you know, going into this, I didn't feel like the only way out was for Deku to go to 100%. You know, that is, like, the the stakes have were raised so high through the story that it then went to there but because but it didn't have to you know like it could have just played out differently with him not needing to go full dragon ball z um you know just getting stronger and going super saiyan basically i do think you are right in a sense of like okay it's not like he just completely threw away intelligence you know being able to deduce Ares quirk was um you know, a, a sign of that. But I do think the overall message, and especially confirmed by the fact that, like, we are retroactively healing some scars, I think is, you know... In fact, I think it's so... So bad. Um, like, the, the, the message being sent is so bad that I'm almost wondering, like, there's no way he didn't realize that this is what he was doing. So maybe I now I feel like I'm messing up, you know, like... <laughs> Like, uh, like I'm misinterpreting somehow, or that this that this does have to be resolved in some specific way as we move forward. Because I really do feel like this was just, I don't know, that could just hit really hard. And yeah, like there was a moment of him being smart, but ultimately it was just I hit really hard, and it's okay. That's that's what that's how we win. Well, he does have a super strength quirk, 
Like, I don't know. I don't necessarily see anything wrong with it, especially given the context. And I think... It's not like, you know, he's going to be dismissing the lessons he's learned, like, going back to breaking all his bones again. Like, he knows I still can't do that. I have to figure out how to be able to manage my power appropriately. But now that he uh, has his full cowl and his shoot style, I do think a lot of his, like, uh, growth in terms of strength is going to be his his quirk literally getting stronger well here's to to counter that though i would so you you said it's not like he's just gonna start breaking his bones again he knows he can't do that i would have said that at the todoroki fight like i would or like uh at the stain fight or you know i would have said that a long time ago and yet he did that with the muscular fight so it's not like this is never like i would have assumed he learned that lesson a, a long long time ago you know back when it first happened probably i would have figured he'd learned this lesson maybe the second time it happened yet it continued to happen and it happened all the way up until you know the most recent time was muscular and then um you know i'm willing i'm willing to shed some forgiveness on the situation because you know i do think you are making correct points i do think but i i i don't think it, i think you are giving perhaps a little too much credit eh, i don't know i kind of feel like you're being a little too harsh on this one well ultimately this is you know there's still a story to be told you know and I don't I don't know the narrative repercussions of this but I will say like in isolation assume <clears throat> excuse me well, I need hold on I need to take a sip of water in isolation or rather using this as a like um momentum piece to move forward my man I'm getting some uh, throat issues using this as like a, uh, a a template to move forward if every fight played out like this I would I would consider that, um, at the very least, thematically boring. Um, so, well, yeah, but I think it's pretty obvious in this case that it's like a one-time thing, which is why I'm not like so bothered by it. I I suppose um, I I'm inclined to l not view it as like I I think it is a one-time thing that we will see. Like, I don't think he's going to backpack Gary every single fight moving on. I don't think that's a viable strategy. <laughs> this is my new sidekick. <laughs> I, although, it, it is actually a viable strategy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. if you just, if you form the ultimate team of Deku, Eri, and Aizawa, you're pretty much unbeatable <laughs> at that point. <laughs> pretty much. All right. Uh, I, I think we've we've thoroughly explored this conversation. Let us know your thoughts in the comment section about that one uh, in specific. I do have some more notes about, um, you know, Deku's growing strength later on in, in, in a less negative light, though. So uh, go ahead. Sure. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's Deku literally breaks every bone in his body like he predicted. And uh, he beats Overhaul. They you know, have their little, we did a moment, but then they make the classic mistake of not putting anyone with plot armor on the van with the bad guy. So the League of Villains raid the transport van, steal overhauls drugs and his arms, and, you know, taunt well, him as they leave. They thought, they thought surely this one random no-name hero would be enough. Surely <laughs> he would be able to handle it. <laughs> he did seem like a pretty good hero like this is a, a sand hero basically gara yeah they didn't they didn't give him a number i wouldn't be surprised if he was like top 20 or something he seemed fairly powerful but uh yeah but but, but it did seem countered by fire yeah it did seem a little dumb um <laughs> not not like a it seemed a little dumb for the like in universe for them to think this was enough <laughs> you know like you yeah, still cause... you still know the league of villains is out there you know that yeah, and you only saw two of them, or three of them here. So, I th I feel like they felt a little complacent. Just, you know, we'll just send this ma van with one hero to uh, secure this r quirk removing drug. Like, that's such a high profile item, but they just don't even care yeah. about it. I mean, who, I mean well, yeah, why, why should you? <laughs> so, I got two questions for this, um, for this little event. One is, as you said, um, Shigaraki, well, I don't actually know if you said this, but Shigaraki basically uh, 
he 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 fucks he fucks over all over. <laughs> I mean, he really. <laughs> I, this is probably like one of the worst things Shigaraki has done in the entire series. This was this was brutal. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it, was, so it was pretty fun. Though. I like my. It. My first question is: Is this the end of Overhaul? Um, now he's still he's still alive. They, he didn't kill him. Yeah. Um, surprisingly, just for fun. Um, but he does enter, you know, a fairly fairly sized list of villains that we have established now that I would expect to return. Um, now each one of them, you know, the list being all for one and Stain, um, and then now him Overhaul. Um, now, each one of them individually, I have said that, like, okay, I could see this being cool, but now we have three of them, and I'm starting to wonder, like, okay, uh, you're building the backlog here, you know, can we, uh, <laughs> can we just wrap these up, you know, do something here? Like, so, so for comparison, I did look at, um, I did go to Naruto and uh, check to see where, um, 20 volumes into that story, who had been introduced at this point, and it was just Orochimaru and Itachi. Um, now, in Naruto, the, Sasuke was turning to the dark side, so he became the antagonist for a little while at this point. Um, but, you know, with if you consider that Orochimaru puppeting Sasuke was made him the main villain, and the Akatsuki and subsequently Itachi went, were like more of the back burner villains, um, we do have a, a comparatively short list of just one for Naruto. Um, now, obviously, Naruto is not like the end-all be-all for everything, but it is just a reference point that um, My Hero Academia has built quite the backlog of heroes that I'm basically just waiting for them. I mean, I'm really, really waiting for Stain. I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> this, is a, this is a long time ago. <laughs> Bring this guy back if you're going to like... I, I, maybe it's just a personal bias. I thought he was dead. You, you tricked me. He's not dead. Fine. You pulled the wool over my eyes on that one. Do something <laughs> with him now. Um, I, I don't know. I kind of think you probably shouldn't be holding your breath on that. Because, <clears throat> well, the, the idea of having too many villains, I think is probably like a lesson Horikoshi has taken from you know, Western comics or superhero wrong running or long running superhero stories tend to have a lot of villains. But I would I would hate it if these just became like rogues. You know, just like oh, you know, Deku's rogue gallery, all for one, stain, the Yakuza. <laughs> like these aren't rogue gallery villains. I don't see why not. I mean <laughs> it's Superman's just, got Lex Luthor, fucking uh, Brainiac. He's he's got plenty of heavy hitters. <laughs> I, okay yeah i guess that's true but also consider that like um western com western comics don't have an end date um no technically my Hero academia doesn't either but it does have the sort of um you know mental end date of of, of school now it could go gone go on beyond that but assuming everything as it is right now it seems like it would end at school so we don't have literally limitless time <laughs> to true. you know utilize these villains I'm I'm just saying it would be disappointing for me to see Stain come back only to be beaten again and then see him come back again like a hundred chapters later only to be beaten again. Like I just it seems, you know, for comics it is in the realm of like these stories never end and you just gotta keep telling them over and over again. But like for for my hero academia specifically, I would like to see succinct story succinct storytelling, you know, like a, a, a planned narrative of sorts. Yeah. But I don't think they're going to be going that route. Like, to me, it seems as if most of the villains we've encountered up to now are not going to be coming back. And that's a... Obviously, like, all for one, probably will. And by extension, Stain might, because of his relationship with the League of Villains. Hold on, but you think Stain might? You don't think Stain definitely will? I think it's highly likely that Stain won't, like, what the be... That he, uh, like, actually be a villain again? Uh, sorry, that that was a bit, uh, uh, a bit much to... <laughs> I, 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 I'm not explain, uh, exclaiming that to your prediction, but more so, like, the, the, the pure idea that Horikoshi would do that. <laughs> like, you could have killed this character off. You better use him. You better use him if he's still alive. Because I swear to God... Now, again, this might just be my spite talking. <laughs> but... It just seems like you had the perfect out to kill him. You had he beautifully impacted the story in every way I would have wanted him to. But you let him live. You showed him in a in a panel or two. Just bring him back, <laughs> or just I don't know. I, I, just do something, please. Now, do I think we'll never see these characters again? I think we'll probably see them 
like overhaul we'll probably see locked up um especially now that he doesn't i don't know if he can still use his quirk now that his arms have been cut off uh <clears throat> Like, obviously, all for one, I predict a full comeback as a villain, but Stain, he could go either way, in my book. It, it is interesting to think that overall, is he really just, if if he didn't come back, he was literally introduced and then gotten rid of. Like, that's, <laughs> <laughs> like, at least, I guess the same thing for Stain, but at least for, that like... That is kind of, like, a filler arc villain. Yeah, at least for All for One, it was like he was built up. You know, it was like literally from the first volume, our first chapter, it was like, you know, All Might was yeah, teasing about this guy. guy. hit me with this really bad move. Yeah. And it was All for One. So at least that, like, if we never saw All for One again, I would be disappointed. Or I would, dis- I would be disappointed that we didn't just kill him if we're not going to see him again. But, um, you know, at least I, I think we got we got what we needed out of him. Now, Stain, same thing. I wish we would have just killed him if we're not going to use him. But Overhaul really feels like we... There's a lot of room left to, to use this guy. Like, a lot. So I would be I would yeah. be really surprised. In fact, I'm a little surprised that they did that to him at all. Like, that he did get his arms removed. I mean, yeah, that, <laughs> that just seems really weird. You know, um, I mean, not weird. Like, it, it was definitely um, impactful in terms of, like, building Shigaraki's character, but... Um, in the grand yeah, scheme of overhaul story, that seems really weird. Huh? He wanted to be the new overlord, and now he's just some armless schmuck. Well, <laughs> you know what they say. When you shoot at the king, you best not you miss. You better not miss. All right. Uh, the other question I had was just generally, what do you think about all the League of Villains stuff? Um, you know, all the way back from, like, the, the Tuga stuff to, you know, to Shigaraki literally ripping fucking overalls arms off. <laughs> because I, I personally, honestly, I really liked, um, you know, you talked about, so, when you talked about in your Carving a Symbol video, you, uh, Shigaraki's intelligence becoming, like, more pronounced and, like, how his, like, first plan when we first meet him is, like, yeah, let's just, I don't know, grab a couple hundred dudes and just, you know, go see what happens. And then this one is, like, <laughs> all right, calculate their route. You know, let's send two guys infiltrating their base. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> clearly there's, there's, like, intelligence being played here. I really like that. But honestly, like, from a character level of just, like, what I enjoyed, I, I enjoyed the Toga and Twice stuff where they were just, you know... You know, there was the scene where twice his like his um his mask get rip gets ripped, and he's like start he starts freaking out. He's like, "I'm gonna you know I'm gonna explode. I'm gonna like rip myself in, apart." And then uh, Toga just comes up and then like ties a thing to his head so it like acts as a mask. And then you know they have a sweet moment. And then there was also the scene where they were like talking about um, Magne and how like um you know they're they're still mad twice about him. Got dying. mad because uh, Chisaki fucking misgendered her. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just genuinely thought all of that stuff was actually endearing. You know, I, I really liked that yeah. stuff. The League of Villains are great, and I really liked uh, Overhaul's introduction and how he, like, sort of, you know, humbled them by just, like, swinging his dick around, and killing one of his sidekicks, and being like, all right, well, I'm going to be the new kingpin, so see you guys later. <laughs> but then, you know, Shigaraki clearly holds grudges yeah <laughs> he wasn't gonna let For that sure. shit slide <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm 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 a big fan of you know like i said like i said with the you know previous discussion on overhaul is that while i think the overall's overhaul's fate was weird for his story i actually do really think it really makes shigaraki interesting like i mean i already thought this character is interesting i actually really like shigaraki but um you know, the fact that, like, he is so spiteful, you know, and he is <laughs> getting so smart. And I don't know. And, and the, the, the way he the way he interacts with, like, his with his League of Villains and, you know, how he does utilize them and how he's sort of manipulating them to some extent because some of them are, like, starting to have doubts. Like, you know, we saw uh, the, the lizard guy. He said he said he's not the lizard guy. He said his name. He specifically Spinner. said this. Yeah, Spinner. <laughs> um spinner is like starting to have doubts about like whether or not this actually is even stain's ideals um yeah because most of these guys are here for stain's ideology and like yet, including twice and toga and but, and dobby um 
basically all of them. <laughs> yeah, um, basically all of them. And Shigaraki doesn't just, believe in any of that shit. Just and he just manipulates them. Leading them by the nose. Like, yeah, this is what we want to do, right? I actually, <laughs> I actually forgot. I, I, I thought for a second that, like, Dobby left and I just had forgotten because he actually hasn't been in anything until, like, after the training camp invasion until now. Oh, my alarm's going off. Hold on. Um, you know, after the training camp invasion until now, he kind of just dropped off the map for some reason. I don't really know yeah, what that he, was about. He plays a very understated role when he's not like in the forefront, which is weird because I actually, when upon introduction, you know, it was him and Toga both introduced at the same time. It seemed like they were, you know, hyping these guys up, and even Toga. I mean, Toga's had screen time, um, but even Toga seems less pronounced than I thought she would be, but. Dobby, like specifically, is really kind of pushed to the the wayside for some reason. I think uh, Toga has the most interaction with the plot out of most of the League of Villains, and Dabby, his moments are like the most pronounced. Like he'll show up when some real serious shit is about to go down. That se- that does seem to be the case, but it doesn't have to be because I mean the total rogi theory is still on the table. You know, you could. Be, I think that's part involved. of it, actually. I think like Horikoshi wants people to be like intrigued by this guy, but he doesn't want them thinking about them all the time, which is why mm. he sort of fades back. That is an interesting thought. It's possible. All right, let's just move on to uh, to a, a, a well, maybe not a sad moment. Uh, let's talk about the death of Night Eye. Yeah, um, Night Eye just dies. <laughs> yeah, you know, some things can be twisted. You know, some fates can be beaten. Some of them you can't. You know, Deku, yeah, he gets to live. Sometimes you do die. <laughs> yeah, Deku <laughs> lives. Uh, you know, Miria lives. Eri lives. Uh, Night Eye is dead, though. <laughs> so yeah. my, my, he, he should have tried being the main character. And maybe he should have just lived. He should have tried punching harder. He didn't. I didn't <laughs> see him throw a single punch. <laughs> yeah. So the question, the, the big question that, um, you know, I have is, was this too soon? I mean, so it's a pretty simple question, but, um, you know, when I talked about his introduction, I think literally last episode or maybe two episodes ago, um, it was, it was under the pretense that like I was reading comments under like the, the, uh, the site where I read the manga and it was like the fan base, just the general fan base just did not seem to like this character. So to have killed them off so fast i mean i don't know what people i still i i don't know what the critical opinion of this character is and i don't know what the critical opinion of his death is but i would i would worry that you know i don't know if this death is all that impactful you know you brought you introduced this guy as like a dick to deku and you know i still i thought he was a good character but like in the general audience's eyes did, did they think this so i don't i don't know you can't speak for everyone but did this death impact you at all um i'll say it definitely surprised me at f- the first time I read it because I, like you said, this character. I mean, looking back on it, it seems like he sort of filled his role, and I'll talk about that in a second. But I guess uh, <clears throat> I was surprised because it did seem like there was so much more uh, bonding for the- this character and Deku to undergo, and I don't know. I guess it just sort of subverted all that. Well, that is, um, you know, did he fill his role is a, is a good topic of discussion because I do have some narrative worries about Night Eye's death. I think overall, um, I would I wouldn't say I I was impacted by his death. Like I wasn't sad. Um, I did enjoy his character while he was around. I am um, I am sad to not have him continue to be around. But like the death itself to me was not sad. Um, however, there I do have some narrative worries about. Um, about Night Eye dying, and the big one would be that, you know, it was that Deku was just in, you know, he he basically was just accepted into this internship, went on one mission, and now he doesn't have an internship anymore. I mean, technically, <laughs> technically he still works there, and it goes to Centipede, um, which is what they said, but, you know, I don't yeah. really foresee that being... I don't know. That that would seem weird to me if he just <laughs> started working for Centipede. So I, I don't know. Maybe maybe he does. But it seems like this basically just removes Deku from his internship while characters like Ochako and uh, and um, Suyu and Kirishima uh, are basically... They're st- I mean, they're, they're still fine, you know? Um, yeah, their uh, internship leaders didn't die, so... So good. I don't... Yeah, so, I, so my worry is basically I just don't know where this 
you know, we basically just lost a potential mentor for Deku. And I'm, I don't really know. It seems like, you know, especially within these last two volumes, we're moving away from Gran Torino and All Might. Um, not that they're going to be gone from the show, but like it, it seems like, you know, we were moving in the realm of like, he's learned what he's needed to learn from Gran Torino. Now he's going to move on to a different person. And now that person's dead. I don't know. You know, do we just introduce <laughs> another one? You know, I don't really know. Uh, I think... Okay, so going back to the question of uh, did Night Eye fulfill his place narratively, I did sort of think, you know, most of this article was about uh, Deku's worth as a successor, and a lot of that was uh, refracted through Mirio. And obviously a big part of Night Eye's place was to build up Mirio as this sort of, like, ideal uh, successor to All Might. And I think when you view Night Eye's death as, like, a part of uh, Mirio's arc, it does uh, grant some interest because, you know, this is his mentor. This is basically his All Might dying here. And that's an interesting <clears throat> thought. Um, you keep going. I do have a counter, but you can finish your point. And I think... Uh, Deku, like, well, Night Eye's relationship with Deku was basically, you're not good enough to be the successor. In fact, I have a better one right here. <laughs> but then Deku basically succeeds where Mirio kind of fails. And I think, you know, that was sort of the whole point of all of this. But did Night Eye need to die for that? <laughs> Well, he didn't need to die, but he, like, got his moment of, like, recognizing Deku as a hero, and, well, I guess he's done now, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my counter to that is that I do think, you know, what you said uh, was that, like, this is basically All Might's, all, the, the equivalent of All Might dying um, for Deku, for, except for Mirio now. Um, I do think that is an interesting way of looking at it. Um, however... It just didn't really feel like that just because of, like, you know, these two characters were literally introduced a couple the, volumes like ago. Like, last, yeah, yeah, last volume. So it's, <laughs> I really am not in a position to be looking at this from the perspective of Mirio because I don't, I don't know Mirio. <laughs> like, I enjoy That's Mirio, fair. but I just don't know. I if, if that was the intention, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was because, in theory, that sounds fine. Um, I do think it is a bit... Um, a bit misguided you know i i think um you kind of jumped in not you uh, horikoshi would have jumped into the deep end um without learning how to swim basically that's a weird metaphor but you get what i'm going for that's <laughs> that is a uh, an interesting stance because i think last episode we talked about like the potential downsides of horikoshi's uh i guess pace like he doesn't really like sitting on on an idea for very long and this might be a symptom of that this potentially premature night eye death yeah I, and <clears throat> just put put this out there i'm not convinced that it was wrong, the wrong choice like i could be convinced that night eye dying was ultimately good i just i do see some holes here like you know i do think the fact that deku does lose out on a potential mentor is a big deal um yeah this definitely is like a missed opportunity but to, to counter that point, though, to counter my own point, um, is that I do, to wrap back to what we were talking about earlier with uh, Deku getting stronger, is I do feel like he's getting a little too strong. Um, and I think, <laughs> you know, within the span of basically everything past the tournament arc, he has developed full cowl, shoot style, then he's went from 5% to 8%, and now he's at 20%. Now, granted, the 20% was a bit extreme, and I don't think he's going to regularly go to 20%, but like... He went to 20% fairly inconsequentially. Now, obviously, I you know, he went to 100% inconsequentially, but that was a very, very specific circumstance. So I don't... Yeah, like, he did go 20% by himself. Yeah, so I do think Deku is getting pretty, pretty strong and a little too fast. I think... I, you know, I went a long, long time ago when, when we talk, when we were still in the tournament arc, we were predicting what was going to happen in the future tournament arcs. I thought like Todoroki still wins the next one, but Deku wins after that. I'm not even sure if that's true anymore because I did not predict Deku to get this powerful this fast. But like at 20%, I don't see how anyone beats him. Like at 8%, he was already like almost about to beat Bak Bakugo, you know? So at 20%, yeah. I don't 
I really don't see how like it just seems like he's scaling so much more powerful and that is literally against you know if he's like if he's beyond um you know if he so much further beyond Todoroki and Bakugo then think of how much further beyond he is to someone like you know Ojiro and um you know fucking yeah. Mineta you know like this, there's clearly too <laughs> too much of a disparity here so so to, to counter my point perhaps we don't want Deku to have another mentor perhaps we do need some sort of narrative obstacle to keep him you know, grounded a little bit. And then, yeah, if you slow down the growth of, uh, just a bit. Because if I'm Ochako and I see Deku beat, you know, beat Overhaul <laughs> in this massive aerial combat, I'm like, you know, guy, I go back to the class. I'm like, guys, I don't, I don't think, we, I don't think we are cut out for this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> in fact, like, Izo, I don't think you're cut out for this stay. either. I think, uh, <laughs> present Mike, you retire. Uh, all my, I mean, you, you're done. <laughs> and then, uh, Deku, Mirio, you guys just run the school. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> you only need two heroes next generation, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that, that, that would be like my big counter. I don't know. The caveat to that counter is that, it, you can't just lose a mentor in that and consider that the solution. The, the solution would have to be like he loses the mentor and then for some reason he continues to not be able to get powerful, whether that be through a mental block or um, he need. There's just a new like uh, uh, task to take, you know, take under or whatever it is. This is this would only be like step one of two, potentially more. But uh, I do think that that would be a way of looking at it that um, you know maybe makes sense to kill off Night Eye. But even then, that would even then that would just be a product of short sightedness. Because at that point, I would just say, why would you even introduce this character? You know, if if if, if it seems like if, if that were the thought process, you it would be literally like introduced him, and then the next volume be like, oh shit, I shouldn't have introduced this guy. He's getting too strong. <laughs> <And> then <laughs> quit, quit, kill him off, kill him off. You know. <laughs> so if if that was the case, I would really need to call out Horikoshi for his short sightedness. I don't know. If, I don't know if that was the case, but you know, if it was. Uh, anything? Uh, to go back to the next um, f- sports festival, I think Deku's growth is definitely, you know, too fast. But the other characters are going to be getting stronger, too. So, and um, especially now that Bakugo and Todoroki have been doing, like, this secretive side training that, like, seemingly they're getting some exercise in. Who knows how much uh, their strength has actually grown? I mean... I guess. I mean, you could say that, but all we saw was babysitting. So <laughs> <laughs> that's all we saw. But that was the re-exam. That wasn't like their classes. So yeah, we never saw their classes. So I, I, I'll say yes. Um, you, you are right. Um, because we did, we did technically see that while they were babysitting, the other people that had to retake the exam, they were just fighting gang orca. So presumably, if if every single le- uh, lecture was just fighting gang orca, then yeah, that would improve them. Um. What I would say is, okay, so that, that boosts up Todoroki and Bakugo. Um, <laughs> now what about the rest of the class? Yeah, what about <laughs> every other person? <laughs> um, and we can, we can talk about that a little more later because we haven't even gotten to that part. Um, but that does sort of right. go into, you know, whether or not these two should have actually failed at all. Um, anything left to say about Night Eye? Um, not really. So the other uh, the other side of this coin of Night Eye's death would obviously be Mirio. As you said in the recap, Mirio did get shot. Uh, yeah, with a quirk removing bullet, which a permanent is one, the permanent kind, unlike the kind Tamaki got shot with a few chapters or a few volumes ago. Well, let's let's put permanent in quotations because even because even in overhauls like exposition of why this thing was created, it was created with the specific goal of in mind of like. It takes away creating a, cur- a cure. Yeah, so it's like and let's let's it. yeah. So there is so the question I I would have to ask is uh, you know we're given a fair amount of hints that Mirio might get his quirk back, including the fact that Mirio said, "Hey, I might get my quirk back." <laughs> um, so the question <laughs> is, is this foreshadowing or is this just hopeful optimism? And like, what what would you want to happen? Do we even want him to get his powers back? Uh, it's interesting because. We don't really talk about, like, vigilantes in here, but there is a character in the, the MHA the MHA side story manga called Vigilantes, where he's basically a vigilante with no quirk, and mm-hmm. he's just a really swole dude who goes around, like, beating up villains. Um, so, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I read, like, a synopsis of this, I didn't actually read it, but it's, it's like, it's sort of like a Misfits-type, um, 
deal, right? Where it's just like him and then like there's an old dude or, you know, it's just a bunch of like people who I, and I might be thinking of a different spinoff or something, but it just seems like from what I read, it seems like a bunch of people who don't really belong in society as heroes, but they're just doing hero stuff anyways. Yeah, more or less. Okay. And he doesn't belong because he doesn't have a quirk. Right. Whereas the other two don't belong because their quirks are shit. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so yeah, I could see... Okay, so Mirio... This actually reminds me of uh, an interesting comment I read a while ago, but I'll skip over that for now. So <clears throat> if Mirio did try to become a hero without a quirk, that is technically feasible in this universe... Well, oh, hold on. Feasible in what way? Is it feasible in the sense that, like, someone else is doing it? Or feasible in the sense that, like, would that even be government allowed? Is he allowed to be a vigilante without a quirk? No. Okay. So, uh, feasible in a, in a sense. Yeah. So, he could do it without permission. But, or, you know, he might get his quirk back. Either way, I don't see him stopping his hero activities. Well, uh, well so, one, I'll say, I don't... I don't really like the idea of him getting his quirk back. I mean, on like a, a raw, like just how much I like Mirio and like, a, um, you know, I just want like, you know, if this was a real person, of course, I, of course, I want him to go to Aerie and be like, just reverse time, man. Just give me my powers back. <laughs> and, I, and I don't see a reason for why that wouldn't work. I don't like, it seems like they, they put so many reasons for him to get his quirk back that I'm almost like they they have to do it at this point. Otherwise, it just doesn't really make logical sense for why it wouldn't yeah. happen. But I, I, in, in, in like interesting narratives, I don't necessarily think giving him his quirk, his quirk back is the right way to go. It feels sort of like counterintuitive. Um, you know, it just felt like getting rid of his quirk so early and to associate it with such a powerful moment because he did, we, we only saw him use his quirk a couple times before it, it was gone. So like to, to do that so early and to associate it with such this, this moment of like, you know, I'm going to lose my quirk to save this little girl because that's what it means to be a hero. It does seem a little counterintuitive to just be like, okay, have it back, you know, or not, maybe not counterintuitive is the right word, but just seems like a little bit of, um, um, you know, cop out. yeah, cop out basically. Um, I see in, that point. within the realms of like retcons. However, oh, go ahead. What were you going to say? I just don't think, uh, I, didn't, I really want Mirio to get his quirk back, basically. It's such a cool quirk. I, I he's agree. such a great hero. I agree, but we had to, like, listen, you gotta have discipline here. <laughs> you gotta separate, like, what we, what we want as humans and what we want as, like, for the best story. So, my, my, sure. my other thing, uh, is that, so, I, I do think him becoming a vigilante is, an interesting route, like a vigilante without hero, uh, without powers. However, the other option is to tie back into a point I made in a previous episode. I do foresee, or I would hope to uh, see, the police becoming a more involved aspect of the story. Would would it be a terrible thing for Miro to become a police officer? Now, when I when I say that, it sounds kind of lame. It sounds a little <laughs> lame, but it does it does sound a lame. <laughs> but you know, like it, it that's sounds just the plot's fault. Because yeah, the it, plot makes the police lame. Yeah, that's the thing. It sounds lame because the only police officers we've met have been lame. Except, like, All Might's friend, but he, he's not not lame. He's just not nothing. He's just, like... Yeah, he's the <laughs> least lame. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it's... It, so, giving Mirio... It, making Mirio into police officer could potentially make the police an interesting facet of the story. So, while yeah, I'm, like... Yeah, definitely increase the coolness of the police office. Yeah. So, I don't... I don't personally think he... Sh- to me, the question is what isn't the question isn't whether or not he should get his quirk back. I don't think he should. The question is like, what does he do beyond that? Because I think you're right. He does. There's no way he just gives up. I mean, from what we see about Mirio, even like literally right after Night Eye's death, you know, I, I actually love this panel. It's like Deku goes in to like basically offer up his quirk and immediately sees you know Mirio's just doing exercises and smiling. He's like, what's <laughs> up, dude? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I i love this guy and i don't think he's the type of person to just give up i'm sure he's gonna have some like mental doubts in the future i don't know how much more we explore this character but i'm sure there's room for like doubting but i i assume at the end just knowing what we know about this guy he's gonna be a hero in the summer guards so the question is just like what how, what avenue does he take to get there now that's what i think should happen However, as I said, they have set up so many opportunities for him to get his quirk back that it's just like, <laughs> like if it was just he seems if, fine not getting it back though. He does, but well, one he he seems fine if it doesn't happen, but he's he does seem optimistic about it 
about it happening. You know, he does want it to happen. You know, he does yeah. he does talk about Ari like in Aizawa said, you know, if she can, that'd be great. Um it just is if if it was like only the only only Ari existed as a potential thing, and because Ari's power is so unstable, then I could totally buy like, okay, it might happen, might not happen. I don't it probably won't happen. But because But they it also is, said we'll just try anything we can. Yeah, because there's that and there's like everyone everyone's trying so hard and there's also there is a cure out there that we know exists that Shigaragi has it's like i don't i don't know it seems like they've set up so many opportunities (laughs) to not go through with it It just seems like i don't know it seems dumb maybe there's just no good solution here uh i don't know i think the i guess maybe they did need the existence of the quirk fixing drugs but maybe if they just didn't have that it would be more ambiguous i guess right now it does seem likely that mario's quirk will probably return i i would see the thing is like i don't think it's a good idea to just get rid of them get rid of the cure entirely because it was such a focal point of overhaul's plan and i do think the plan like i do think that plan specifically was good characterization for like his place as like in the in, in his backstory and in his uh, position as the yakuza and as like the underling to his boss i do like the plan maybe what should have just happened was that like he just never got around to developing the cure yet because he literally just invented the you know the the disease itself so right maybe if they just did that they wouldn't have been caught like horikoshi wouldn't have been caught in this position i don't know well i think we could have had a version of overhaul's plan without the cure because like, the Yakuza's place in this society is one that's been pushed down by the, by, like, the surgeons of quirks. So, if, like, Overhaul's goal was just to r- remove as many quirks from heroes as possible so that the Yakuza can, like, regain power, that would probably work as mm-hmm. well, considering he, he fails so early in his plan anyway. I see what he's saying. <laughs> I suppose that's true. The way the way I was thinking about it, and this doesn't negate your idea, but the way I was thinking about it is that, like, the business aspect of manufacturing the cure as well seems so in tune with what he would, what he thinks right. his boss would want. I didn't even, I don't even think he like. Well, I, I'm pretty sure, just based on what we know of overall, is that he wouldn't want the cure to exist at all. I think he's comfortable just getting rid of everyone's quirk, but I think he thinks his boss would want the market value, you know, more than anything. So that's why he did it. That's that's sort of how I interpreted it. That doesn't necessarily negate your idea. Your idea could still exist because the idea of like um, you know, just getting rid of quirks is beneficial to the Yakuza is true. So uh that is that yeah. is a good point. All right, anything left to be uh said about Mirio and his l- l- uh quirk or lack thereof? Uh No? Hmm. Yes, maybe? <laughs> no, I'm good. All right. From there, we transition into version two of the license exams. Uh, you want to recap yes. that for us? Yep. Uh, Bakugo and Todoroki, they retake their provisional license exam. All right, the... that's about it. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> question of the week is... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. The test is basically to perform talk no jutsu on some troubled kids. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, I guess it's like a hero test. That serves the purpose, right? Sure, sure. They run into uh, Kami and Inasa, who also both failed, but Kami failed because she never got to actually take the exam. Mad cause... lit fam. <laughs> <laughs> He's got to dab on those haters. <laughs> <laughs> dab on them. <laughs> God. If Kami doesn't dab, I'm I'm never reading this manga again. <laughs> She's so like, what is up, fellow kids? <laughs> <laughs> what a what a terrible yet genius character. <laughs> yeah, somebody who spends all their time on Urban Dictionary. <laughs> it's truly, truly Horikoshi at his best with this one. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they they have to, you know basically convince these kids to stop being assholes yeah i mean these are very vague (laughs) these are some rowdy ruffians (laughs) yeah and i mean the kids are like actually like terrible kids like they're running around uh, fucking with everyone insulting everyone and uh, physically assaulting yeah (laughs) they said oh it's time to use our bombs (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> one of those guys was just a cannon. That was his quirk. He's just yeah, a cannon. He just had a cannon in his mouth. <laughs> and one of them called Todoroki five people. Like, yeah. What the fuck, kid? <laughs> I don't think that was getting dubbed. I think they're gonna have to change that one for the English dub. <laughs> they better not. They better not. <laughs> if Todoroki doesn't become five PP man in like canon, <laughs> I'm gonna be pissed. That should be his hero name. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so while this is going on, um, Endeavor is actually at the uh, exam, and he sits with his boy All Might, and he's like, hey man, what is being a symbol of peace? I kind of missed a seminar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, can I take the license exam? <laughs> <laughs> I like that he's like, as opposed to, because when we first saw him step up as the number one hero, he was just sort of, uh, like, angry about it. Like, I didn't get here the way I wanted to, so I'm not accepting it. But now he's like, all right, well, I have to be the number one hero, so I better do a good job. If you asked me, just not to answer the question of the week, but just to jump ahead for a little bit, if you asked me in a couple months from now this question of which characters had the most impressive character arc, I could see my answer being Endeavor. Not that he's changed yet. He, I mean, he's clearly changing. Um, but right. I think we are laying the groundwork for an amazing character arc. Um, you know, I think it, given some time, you know, I think I think this is going to shape up to do really well. I don't know how much time it's going to need because you know I am uh, I am hip to some future events, but I don't know the exact details, but. So I don't know if if the a couple months or a couple years, but I am looking forward to this character <laughs> arc. Yeah, it's gonna be a good one. Uh, though, not everyone wants it to happen. Well, that's because my Hair Academia fans are the worst, and <laughs> <laughs> it just it goes back to the same thing I said in like the last episode, which is like these, you know, and, we, and we're friends with some of these people. Is that these people don't they don't view this as a story? You know, they don't view this as like. Yeah, I, I I have more to say about this in the question of the week, so we can, we could just hold off on that if 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 you're chill sure. with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where we'll were we in the recap? Later. So, you know, uh, Todoroki, Bakugo, Inasa, and Kami are taking the uh, makeup exam, and you know they're basically wondering how do we get through these kids. And Bakugo's answer, of course, is just. Let's just beat them up. And then they'll have to listen to us. <laughs> which, was, and, <laughs> which was like half cracked. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is half right. Because to, as I've uh, <laughs> said before, to yeah. use Top No Jutsu, you got to start with a show of force. Correct. But, <clears throat> well, I guess they kind of do. But instead of like actually fighting, they just sort of like neutralize all the kids' quirks. Which does demonstrate that they are stronger. Which is good because if these kids were like actually giving trouble to Todoroki, Bakugo, Inasa, and I guess Kami, but I don't know, she doesn't seem particularly strong. I'm I don't know why she was even included in this. Like, um, even from like both from a, a story perspective and like in in universe logic perspective, why was she not just sent with the other students to go fight Gang Orca? Why was she here? I don't really know. I don't know why they <laughs> separated these students from the kids fighting Game well, Orca in the first place. It was, from my understanding, it was because Bakugo, Inasa, and Todoroki just have bad attitudes. But Kami doesn't. <laughs> I mean, I guess if, you just, if you're annoyed by her, <laughs> I guess that's <laughs> something. But, like, but she don't wasn't... those other kids need to retake their provisional license exam too? Yeah, but they, they just failed. As to where, like, Bakugo... Oh. So is like, it because they made it to the second stage? No. So everyone made it to the second. Everyone in that test made it to the second stage and failed um, because the guy who made it, who didn't pass the first exam from Shiketsu, isn't allowed to retake it. He's, he was just there watching. So everyone who's who is fighting gang worker or is a part of this group of four did take the second exam. Take go to the second round and failed. However, those guys just failed because they failed. Um, as to where Todoroki, Bakugo, and Inasa failed because of their bad attitudes. So this was like. 
they had I specific see. training here just to quell their attitude problem. But again, why is Kami didn't have a bad attitude? Why is she here? Yeah, that is a uh, kind of odd. Now that you mention it, I guess the only possible, like the only real explanation, is probably just that Horikoshi wanted to actually introduce this character, <laughs> and this was the only way he could do it. Wanted to give us that mad lit introduction. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he he was like. The fans are gonna love this. I gotta, <laughs> <laughs> gotta throw that in there. Okay. Uh, where were we in the recap? Did they did they win yet? <laughs> <laughs> they do win. That's all that matters. Yeah. And, uh, Endeavor says to Shoto, "I'm proud of you, son. I'm gonna be a hero that you can be proud of." And his, Shoto's like, "Fuck you, dad." <laughs> <laughs> He also, like, smiles a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Inasa actually uh, has a moment of also becoming better, uh, bettering himself, as he goes up to Endeavor and says, I, you know, hey, I'm rooting for you, despite the fact that the reason he is here is because, you know, he, how much he hates Endeavor. So, hey. Yeah. Impressive character arc? Hint, hint. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's all that bullshit. Who the fuck cares about this? If you didn't tell, I don't. I don't care about this fucking license exam. So the question is: narrative results of Todoroki and Bakugo failing. Was it worth it? My answer is probably not. I mean, like, I just, <laughs> I don't really get. I because even, so as I said when I we were talking about why Bakugo failed, if the question is. He, if, if, or rather, if the reason he failed is because he was had such a bad attitude, I don't think he's going to change to a point where his like bad attitude is fixed enough to have warrant passed it, warranted passing that exam, right? Like that's not to say he's not developing as a character; he definitely is. But I don't think he'll ever go go to the point of being like, um, "Hey guys, I'm your number one hero here to rescue everybody." No, I think he's <laughs> always going to be that fucking asshole, and that's fine. I like Bakugo as a character. I like that aspect of him. Um, I still, right. I, but so the the fact that like the, clearly the focus is is on attitude and to like quell his attitude, I think is a lost cause. I mean, sure, Horikoshi could just make him do that. I wouldn't like that to happen. So hopefully he doesn't. But I I do think it is you know a fruitless endeavor, and you know I still think. You know, I'm still unconvinced on the Todoroki situation. So it seems like, in, you know, to go back to what we said, uh, what we were talking about earlier, where it was like, this is, this is totally going to make Todoroki and Bakugo stronger. It is. Except it could have made Ojiro stronger. Or it could have made Jiro stronger. Or it could have made, you know, <laughs> Mineta stronger. And, like, they need it way more. Like, Todoroki and Bakugo are already strong. Bakugo beat Deku, like, three chapters ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. But I think... um Okay, because uh, our boy Deku is aiming to be number one hero, I think the gap growing between him and the bottom of the class is fine. But I do think it does become a bit of a problem when he starts, like, <clears throat> overgrowing or outgrowing uh, Bakugo and Todoroki by a significant margin. Because they're, like, his main competition in his well class. I don't think the solution is to have Deku grow at his current rate and then just have Todoroki and Bakugo also grow at that rate. I think the solution is to have them all slow down and just, you know, I don't see, I don't think there has to be disparity. Like, sure, I get what you're saying. If there is a disparity between top and bottom, that's fine. But I don't think there even has to be one. I think if we just brought up characters like Jiro and Ojiro, then I think we could just have the best of both worlds and we just don't have Deku get to 8% yet or 20% yet and we don't have... Um, you know, Todoroki and Bakugo getting that strong yet, and we just pace this out a little slower. I think we could have, you know, you know, really got, you know, both things. Maybe. I, I just, I don't know. I don't really see, like, the benefit of that, because Deku is going to have to outgrow everyone in his class eventually anyway. Yeah, but we're still in the first year. Like, we're halfway through the first year. <laughs> That's true. I do think, like, compared to how impressive the top of the class is, the how unimpressive the bottom of the class, like, you know, the Minettas, the, I guess, Kodas, it does seem like uh, <clears throat> these guys, they're not going to be uh, contesting for number one hero when they graduate by any stretch of the imagination. But 
I don't necessarily think that's such a huge problem because of the number of heroes we've seen who are like, you know, good, but not like all might good, you know? So, I mean, like, yeah. some of the UA students have to be average heroes, is what I get, I'm getting at. I get what you're saying, and I don't think you're wrong. I just, my ultimate concern isn't about whether or not there is a disparity. My ultimate concern does go back to, um, you know, if we are going to make someone stronger, does it need to be Deku, Todoroki, and Bakugo? And I don't think the answer is yes, because as you pointed out earlier, Deku succeeded where Mirio failed. Now, I'm not going to say Deku is stronger than Mirio right now, but it's clearly, like, it is not as big as we thought it was, you know? So, <laughs> you know, and that that is literally, Mirio was like, I'm going to be number one. Well, not Mirio didn't say this, but people were like, Mirio is just the number one hero. As soon as he graduates, he's going to fucking be the number one hero. Everyone already thinks it, you know, and he, he's he's a senior and he's the best. He's the fucking best. He's just amazing. And Deku's like, oh, well, actually, in, <laughs> you know, that's actually me. So I don't know why you thought that. <laughs> Actually, I think I'm part of the big three now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, what a what a dick move if Deku was like, "Hey, uh, so I heard you guys need a new, a new uh, Kirk, uh, person." <laughs> yeah, I can't really be the big three if one of you doesn't have a quirk, right? So, <laughs> I, oh, just to go back, this kind of unrelated. I really liked the idea that like it it was it was um, Neji Ray Neji Ro, what, what's her name Neji Ray Neji Ray and Tamaki. We're like the big two, and then they're like, "All right, Mirio, you're part of the big three. And then, like, yeah, over time, it shifted to Mirio's clearly the, the leader here. But like, it was, it there was a lot of emphasis put on the fact that Mirio was not strong. You know, he became strong. You know, right. so I, I, I really like that aspect. But that that's just a random side tangent. The only thing to go back to the Todoroki and Bakugo stuff. The only thing that I really liked coming out of this was the endeavor development. So like. In a sense, that kind of has to come with Todoroki failing. Eh, even that's not necessarily true. It, this specific situation could only happen with Todoroki failing, but like he could have still talked to All Might at this yeah. exam, or he could have just talked to All Might at a different place. <laughs> you know, got to, got tea <laughs> or something. That's so, also true. So I don't think it has to come from this specific scenario. But if I'm going to say anything from this license exam. I really came out liking it would be Mad Lit Fam, and then at a at a far second place, it would be the Endeavor Development. <laughs> <laughs> Anything left to say about the uh, license exams? Mm. Nah. Yeah, fuck these these fucking dumb exams. I hate them. All right, last. <laughs> oh, uh, I, I didn't. We don't need a. It's really short. So uh, there's there's a moment where um. Deku having this is at yeah, the end of the volume. One more important thing happens. Yeah, um, Deku basically, you know, he's back from the internship, back from the mission, and uh, you know, he people are being nice to him. You know, people are being nice to everyone, and then but someone's being a little too nice. Someone's feeding him the cheese. <laughs> if you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, you leave your mouth open for one second, all of a sudden this Frenchman's shoving cheese in it. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So, yeah. Uh, question: are, are we being led to believe that? Ayama is the mole. Now, here's what I'm going to say. When we did the mole question on for question of the week, I did look up the... some theories and I did come across the fact that oh, someone like someone ri- ri- uh, wrote an article like, "Oh my god, did my hero academia just reveal who the mole? Why is my camera out of focus? Never mind. Uh did my hero academia just reveal who the mole was and it was about Ayama?" And when I read the article, <laughs> it's probably when this chapter came out. Yeah, when I read the article, was talking about when I read the article, I was like, holy shit, it is him. Like, the way they described the events was like, this is definitely the mole. And then I read it, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, is, if the question is, are it's we being led, to, <laughs> if the question is, are we being led to believe that I am as the mole? The answer is yes. But I, I think this is the, the, the most obvious fake out in the world, at least from yeah. my perspective. This is clearly a fucking fake out. There's no way they'd laid on this thick, you know? Like, <laughs> Especially because they kept it so understated and so, like ambiguous for so long yeah and aoyama is one of the people we like crossed out as like it can't be aoyama because he saved um what's his face tokoyami during the um hidden forest of death (laughs) yeah i just it does it doesn't seem i don't know what it is i don't know if you already know what i don't know if this has been established i imagine has it seems it seems sort of just like a gag like it seems like it's the type of thing that's going to get resolved (laughs) in the next five pages of like the next chapter um i don't know that's 
I'm not going to spoil, <laughs> I guess, but we'll see. Yeah, I, I, the, so yeah, the answer is yes, but it's, it's a, to me, it seems like a comedy fake out. I don't know if it's supposed to be comedic. It played off comedic to me. Um, but yeah, that, that is okay. the last. I guess the question is, why do you think he's standing outside Deku's window watching him <laughs> at night? <laughs> um, well, if you, if you, okay, so if you asked me, if you, if you just pitched this to me, I didn't read it, and you just pitched me, Aoyama is, you know, he's just, he's acting really touchy and, you know, kind of like stalkerish, and he's just out Deku's window at night, and, you know, if you just pitched that to me, and I didn't, and I knew it wasn't a mole thing. I would honestly guess, like, Horikoshi seems really, really progressive. It would not surprise me if Ayama was just gay and had developed a crush on Deku. Um, I, the way I, it plays out doesn't quite seem like that. Um, but it, I, yeah, I'm not... It's a little too creepy. <laughs> yeah, I'm not ruling out the possibility um, that that is what happens. Um, I don't think that is what happens, but it, it, it's at least on the table. If I were to guess, other than that... Uh, why is my camera out of focus again? Why does it keep doing this? So weird. Um, I don't know. It just it is uh, difficult to think of an explanation for something that bizarre without it being like really sinister. <laughs> I just so uh, so I did read some chat. Uh, it's like end of chapter discussions on Reddit about this, and someone posed the idea that like Aoyama is secretly quirkless, and he actually just has like a tech that the, his because he only uses the thing with the belt so like they just think the belt yeah. is um so they that's the, an the, interesting idea the theory is that like he's quirkless and he's he's he is like bakugo has understood that deku also was quirkless and like this thing happened and he's just kind of curious about what that is and he's trying to like rub up to deku to figure it out um that seems there there are like elements to that theory that I think is interesting um but the idea that he Aoyama is quirkless seems a little logically weird to me because like surely UA would know that like <laughs> <laughs> yeah they would have done some sort of test yeah I don't know what the test would be but surely UA would be able to figure out like whether or not someone actually has a quirk or is just using a weapon <laughs> they just need to look at his fucking Although, toe dude technically <laughs> technically one of their teachers just uses a gun so maybe they don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah in this society you can in fact be a hero with tech I did, just you gotta keep it on the DL I've noticed that guns are just becoming more common which uh I, just, I like, you know, the fact that people are just starting to use guns more often. You know, I just... Yeah, there was another villain who just used a gun, and his quirk was like, he made people tell the truth. Yeah, I just... Because I do think, you know, while I think it is totally reasonable for a society like this to not have guns, I do think some people should use guns. Um, and I do think it should be, you know... people who Characters have... who need to supplement their strength in combat yeah should have guns like especially villains of course um so i i do i do like the the increased prevalence of that um that's unrelated to aoyama as the mole but yeah th those are my thoughts on the aoyama mole stuff do you have anything to say about that <laughs> well obviously you know i know what uh aoyama is doing out there but when i did first read this and having forgotten that uh Aoyama has done some heroic stuff, like when he saved Tokiyami. I did. I was convinced, like, okay, this might be a mole. <laughs> Cause right. It's just so suspicious. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pitch an idea, and you just give me one cough for yes, two coughs for no. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, if you just happen to cough coincidentally, and it's not actually a spoiler, then so be it. Um, is this something, is this like some sort of comedic love triangle maybe? Thing? Like I'm thinking, so just tell, get, see if I'm on the right tracks here. Is like, does Aoyama like one of the girls who was on the mission? So like Najire or Suyu or Ochako, and he's using Deku to get closer to those girls. Am I, am I on the right track there at all? Huh. Uh, what was it? One cough for no, two for yes? <laughs> sure <coughs> okay damn <laughs> <laughs> that i mean that would be an interesting way for this to play out but it would also sort of be like then why the fuck did you make that the end of the last chapter if it's just he wants to 
a date. Just for <laughs> I'm telling you this. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but this played out super comedic to me. Not that not that I necessarily laughed, but it was like this did not play out at all serious to me. So like the idea that this would be the mole seems preposterous. Um, all right, here, here's the next idea. Uh, you know, cough once for no, cough two for yes. Um, is he just locked out of his room and needs Deku to open the door? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> oh, well, was that two? Was that two? <laughs> I feel well, like I, already... I answer. But I might as well, just say yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anyways, let's just move on to the final question of the week. I actually do have a lot to say about this, so I actually feel like you should go first. Um, question of the week again: Which character has had the most impressive character arc? Uh, let us know your answer in the comment section below. Do you want to go first? I, I have a lot to say, so if you... Yeah, I'll go first. Okay. Now, clearly, uh, people who know me know that I'm a big fan of Bakugo, and a lot of the uh, hype around Bakugo is his potential for the character arc. So, you know, people are probably going to assume I'm a little biased towards him, which is true. But Bakugo is probably not my answer here, because the amount of actual character development we've seen from him, uh, in this volume, he has a line where he's talking to the uh, one of the trouble kids, and he basically says something like, uh, if, you keep, if you keep looking down on the people, you won't uh, be able to recognize your own weakness, which, you know, is surprisingly humble coming from him but as far as like a huge character arc that's like more a precursor than a conclusion in my opinion so i don't think he's come that far for me to give him this pick my choice would honestly have to be shigaraki because i don't know if most impressive but definitely most interesting the arc I'm most invested in has to be Shigaraki's because his evolution as a villain has been fucking phenomenal. Mm-hmm. That is um, that is, a, that is a good answer. One I actually didn't even consider. Um, so I, I actually am willing to tweak it accordingly. Um, the interesting thing about this question is that I actually don't think there's that good, good of an answer. Now that you said Shigaraki, I think it might be him. Um, just for to preface, I actually did put uh, write down Bakugo, um, just because, you know, you, you said this in a, uh, one of the previous episodes. So much of the story, especially recently, has been about introducing new people um, and like new heroes and stuff, and it's all about like executing on these cool concepts for characters, and th- it has done really, really well. In fact, like when I think of like when when i cuz the keyword here is impressive right who has impressed right. me and i think about a lot of the characters it's not that it's not that no one has character arcs you know everyone everyone in the show has i mean not not literally everyone but plenty of people have character arcs in the show um but none of them really impress me it's not like i had to go to my hero academia to even get bakugo Char- like when i think of an impressive character arc i think of like zuko from avatar now granted avatar is is a completed show and my hair academia is still go- ongoing so for all i know my hair academia will end with bakugo be being even better than zuko i don't know but as for right I now i thought todoroki was zuko but it's actually endeavor <laughs> as for right now um no one is really impressing me with a slight asterisk on shigaraki I actually do think that's a pretty good answer so you know but when i do think of like what my my hero academia is like really good at to me it is the the introduction of like really cool concept characters and like in executing on those concepts you know uh, you i think of like the fact that fat gum can come in and and out like in that instant and like night eye in a sense could come in and out and you know these villains could come in and out and it's 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 all working really well i think that's a huge strength to the to the story that i i might not get anywhere else or not literally anywhere else but very rarely in other stories um right but like i said i think i would give it to bakugo um just out of everyone i do see i i think i give him a little more credit than you do um you know i i I think no other character has like when i think of like people worth analyzing you know worth making a video about i don't even think any other character 
other than Shigaraki and Bakugo, like, could even really warrant that much. Yeah, and most of the characters, while they've had their arcs, they kind of come out on both sides of the arc being relatively similar. An obvious example of this is, like, Ida, you know? He had that whole stain arc, and by the end of it, not much of his personality had changed because he went from being someone who wanted to be a great hero to someone with a better idea of what a great hero is. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Whereas with Bakugo, like he has actual like personality flaws to address, and you know his character arc is about uh, correcting those flaws. Um, you know, I, 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 we were talking about Endeavor earlier, and I had brought up you know how shitty some fans of this story are and it's been <laughs> it's been really frustrating because like a lot of times when we when we do this i like go back to old chapter discussions just to see what like the general consensus was for like characters and you know plot details and stuff like that and it's really been frustrating for me to like revisit old discussions about bakugo because you know even even mother's basement did this in a recent video i actually didn't watch the video i just saw the the, the description and like in the description he said Like, something along the lines of how Bakugo went from a terrible character to, like, one of the best. And to me, that is so, you know, short-sighted. To to have ever thought that Bakugo was a terrible character, I think, is... (laughs) You didn't see this art coming? Come on. Yeah, like, you you really can't fucking see the groundwork being laid. Like... You just saw you just saw a guy being angry and we're like fuck this guy he's just a dumb idiot angry angry boy like <laughs> oh, oh, what the fuck did you do? <laughs> like you come, this it's the same about. thing with Night Eye actually because like it was super obvious he was going to recognize Deku but everyone was like this guy's been talking shit about Deku fuck him. Yeah, I, and this is this is what I'm talking about. Like, it's just I I feel like I I don't want to harp on this too much because I actually think like among people thinking critically of the show. I mean, this is a relatively accepted idea, but I think, like, the general audience that likes My Hero Academia doesn't view this as a story. They just view it as, like, real people doing real things. And, like, yes, of course, if, you know, Bakugo is a real person, I'd think he's fucking insane. You know, I'd, I'd hate this guy in real life because he's just yelling all the time and he wants people to kill themselves. And it's like, dude, calm down. Of course, but this isn't real life. This is a story. You know, like, of course, in real life, Endeavor is a terrible person and he, like, raped his wife and like beats his children and like yeah that's all terrible but this is a story and i should expect him to grow from that and you know seeing endeavor get character development is not akin to like saying that beating your wife is okay you know it's not the same yeah. thing I, I don't know it's 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 incredibly frustrating now again i do think i do i do think like the critical community is on our side about this but i just think yeah. my academia while, while I'm not, like, I, I try not to be, like, a hipster type of person, like, this this shouldn't go into the mainstream. It, it really does feel like the more My Hero, My Hero Academia pushes into the mainstream, the more these shitty, like, takes on the show appear. And it's just, it's, it is incredibly frustrating, especially co- seeing it come from someone like Mother's Basement, who, like, I don't personally like Mother's Basement's videos, but, like, he is an analysis channel, and he does, you know, at his best, he is pretty good. So I don't... To see him even, you know, again, I didn't watch the video. I just, what he said in the description, to see him even, like, tout that idea to me is insane. You know, like, I I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I think um, with a lot of uh, these, okay, so for people who think we might be overreacting, there is a, in, like, recent chapters when Horikoshi has made attempts to move Endeavor's character arc forward, he ended Huge up receiving pushback. he ended up receiving death threats as a result like people were not pleased that endeavor was uh trying to redeem himself but like that's insane like why would you want these characters to be shitty people forever <laughs> yeah i don't it just it reeks of like the very basic misunderstanding of what a story even is like uh, yes, bad people become good people in stories. That is what happens. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> just it's it, character arcs. These happen. The same thing you could like, you know. Again, this well, not again, but like this goes into sort of like maybe not quite a valid statement, but it it, it does feel like the same people who would tell you know how great Deku is for like the minor character developments are the same people who would like trash on Endeavor for receiving anything. You know, it, it, to me that just right. seems. 
it's just because they like like you said they does uh, they decide whether they like these characters based on like whether they'd be friends with them yeah which is just a really really misguided way at the very least you know i don't think there's anything wrong with sort of thinking like that because like as i we were talking earlier about like yeah we want mirio to get his powers back not and it's, it has nothing to do with i mean you so maybe like a little part of us think that maybe the narrative would be cooler with mirio getting his powers back but surely like 99 percent of it has to do with the fact that we just really like mirio and we think he's a really cool kid and you know he's really nice and we want him <laughs> to just have good things but like you yeah. need to have the, the 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 ability to separate story from like you know just wish fulfillment you know like story story dictates one thing that and that will be the most interesting thing that's not always going to be the one that makes you the most happy or like not happy but like it's not gonna be always the one that makes you the most like you know warm and fuzzy inside you know you get what i'm saying yeah all right i don't know that's that's pretty much all i had to say about that fuck the fuck everyone fuck this (laughs) dumb my academia shit i'm i'm glad to be moving on all right let's let's ditch this tangent uh, all right, general. Oh, did you have anything else to say on the question of the week? Uh, no, I already gave my answer. All right, let's just do some general thoughts. Um, I do think you know. I said early, I said um last week that we were on an upwards trend. I actually been saying that for the past like three weeks. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, I'm. I do think we still are, but um, you know, I'm not gonna lie. I I do think this was like, you know, if if before we were going like up two by two i feel like this one was just going up one you know it it was it was a minimal improvement and i feel like the the improvement that did happen can 100 percent just be you know attributed to the fact that the narrative stakes were just so high that like being able to stick the landing at any degree was going to make me happier than i was last week but like in terms of you know whether or not i think this is like actually really really good um I, i i'm not I'm not as convinced. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, um, I do think the, the, the license exams were pretty fucking lame. And, you know, this is, this is more personal to me, but perhaps not because you also seem to relate to some of these issues is some of the fight choreography, um, did get a bit hard to just actually understand. You know, I, I don't. Yeah. And because like literally the first volume, the entire first volume was just the overhaul fight. You know, it was, it was it was a bit difficult. Yeah, it was. Uh, there's always going to be like gaps with manga, obviously, but I feel like in this case the gaps were harder to fill in by yourself, which just makes reading the actual manga a bit more uh, difficult. And I don't know, it's not a problem that is usually plagued Torikoshi, in my opinion. I think normally he has a pretty good like grasp of. Uh, what's happening between the panels but here in these two volumes it definitely got a little muddier yeah well uh, so what are your general thoughts did you did you enjoy this more or i would actually say i probably enjoyed the last two volumes more than these two but they're definitely both highly enjoyable i mean the the highlights of this uh, these two volumes for me are everything with a uh, mirio and you know when shigaraki catches up to chisaki and like taunts him and shit both really fucking great moments love them love them love them yeah you can pair those against tamaki and like fat gum and kirishima from last two volumes i those i kind of like those a little more so yeah if you moved um oh quick update um where we left off last week i was i was shit talking night eyes fighting capabilities and the i i had said like the next chapter was night eyes fight because that's what it said at the little end of the thing it said night eye versus whatever whatever um and then it turns out that fight was literally <laughs> one page long so fuck you yeah <laughs> that was kind of silly i mean he did fight against chizaki for a little bit but he literally yeah. did worse than mirio so um but to, <laughs> to go on to go to your point those two points the those two sections that you pinpointed i do think yeah those were incredible highs um exactly well, the, the the Deku versus overall aspect of the fight ended up being a little long. So um, while I did like Mirio versus overall, um, you know, it wasn't without its complications, but that's probably a little more personal on my end. Um, if, if you move, if you were able to move those two fights into the last two volumes, I think the last two volumes skyrocket to an unbeatable level, at least comprehensible to the, the story as it is now. Um, and then yeah. this, this, this would fall this you know the the rest like the deku versus overall stuff is not even good enough to like 
even be a comparable level at that point for me. Yeah, if Mirio versus or Mirio catching up to Overhaul and like fighting all the Yakuza by himself was in the last two volumes, it would be like no question. Those would be my favorite two volumes. But since it's in you know this section, yeah, they're a bit closer. Yeah, it's enough to bring this section up, but uh, not 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 quite cutting it, cutting it. Yeah. All right. Anything else to say on that? This episode's already pretty fucking long, so... Yeah, I think we're at, like, over an hour and a half. All right, everybody, that's gonna do it for this episode, this week's episode of Training Arc. If you're watching this on YouTube, head on over to Patreon.com and consider pledging to get the next episode on Monday. Otherwise, we will see you in a week with the last two volumes of My Hero Academia in this current run. Crazy. We made it. (laughs) (laughs) Bye-bye. Later, guys.